Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week. Signal Sciences NextGen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps toolchain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash signal sciences. Detect security threats in minutes before it affects your customers with Datadog's newest security monitoring product. Teams can investigate security threats and malicious activity in real time using 75 plus out of the box detection rules and detailed observability data, metrics, traces, and logs in one integrated platform. See it for yourself by signing up for a free trial and receive a Datadog t-shirt by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Datadog. By connecting to your code repository, Actrix generates a topology across your full stack to reveal risks so that you can harden your architecture. It also scans code for violations against compliance and security standards to enforce best practices. In addition, Actrix develops threat models using vulnerability feeds, IAM privileges, and other data to predict potential breach paths. Learn how easy it is to get started with Acurix at securityweekly.com forward slash Acurix. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, joined by Matt Alderman and John Kinsella. It's official. Security Weekly, in partnership with Cyber Risk Alliance, is excited to present Security Weekly Unlocked on December 10th, 2020. The inaugural edition of Security Weekly Unlocked also celebrates Security Weekly's 15th anniversary. That is a long time. Go Security Weekly. Registration will be open soon, but Call for Speakers is open now. So please come visit securityweekly.com slash unlocked to submit your speaking session. Security Weekly is ramping up our webcast and technical training schedule for the rest of 2020. In our next webcast, you will learn how to reduce the blast radius of your cloud infrastructure. Visit securityweekly.com slash webcast to see what we have coming up or visit securityweekly.com slash on demand to view our previously recorded webcasts. And this brings us to the news. And in fact, last week, we start off with a really fun and good conversation about Microsoft and more about the, the volume of bugs that were coming out of them um, on Patch Tuesdays. This week, we have a very similar uh, discussion about Microsoft, I think, that's going to talk about possibly something that generates potentially a whole lot of new bugs for them to fix in a very good way. Um, John, th th this stood out for you. Why don't you um, walk us through Microsoft's new news? Yeah, um, they came out one fuzz, and I think actually, Mike, you might have, um, by the end of last week, read more about than I did. I, I found it, I put a bookmark in, and they were announcing, what, on the, I think I said the 19th? Um, yeah, so it's it's. I, I think you've actually added more notes in than I looked at. But they, I think we might have commented a few weeks ago. They went back um, earlier this summer and they pulled back the fuzzing service which they had, uh, and now they've actually released out this this new one, one, one fuzz, which is intended to be, um, you know, one tool to sort of do. It looks it, it's sort of interesting sounding. I haven't got a chance to try it yet. Uh, was looking at the code earlier. Um, but they've they've come up with a single tool to not just do fuzzing, but actually looks like they're they're thinking about how do you bring that back into both the CI process as well as um, logging and detection. So really, what do you do with that tool? Um, I I don't know if you dug a little deeper than that. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was really interesting here. It's not so, it's not so specific to a specific fuzzing technique. Um, mm -hmm. they, they talk a lot about libfuzzer, and um, for all of you LLVM fans out there, please dive onto that. But um, as John was highlighting, this is very much an infrastructure for managing the resources to launch collect and analyze the results of a fuzzing process. And I think that is what's really effective and really important about this because fuzzing is quite a, you know, it, it relies heavily on time and resources available. So it's very much something that does not scale manually. You need to scale it in a cloud environment like Microsoft does here with Azure. And um, even looking at it, what's neat is that already there's some pull requests from um, some of the group that's supporting AFL++. So basically the next generation that that a, a group of open source um, and security researchers are continuing on from Google's original AFL work. So it's really neat to see already that people are pulling in particular 
fuzzing, specific fuzzing capabilities, frameworks, into what this one fuzz environment that makes it a lot easier to manage the life cycle, if you will, of um, being able to fuzz your compiled binaries. Yeah, we covered this a little bit last week on Enterprise Security Weekly because it came out, I think, right after the show last week. Mm-hmm. And, and when, it, when I read the article on the Enterprise Security Weekly side, it sounded like this was an internal tool they used as part of testing Windows 10 and decided to release mm-hmm. aspects of this out as an open source project. And Paul and I were just reminiscing like 10 years ago, would you have ever thought, you know, Microsoft to be releasing open source uh, technologies out to the overall community. I mean, look at the change in the last 10 years to the stance that Microsoft's had from closed source to a lot of the open source uh, components they've been releasing over the last few years. So, you know, a very different Microsoft than, than something we would have talked about 10 years ago. Yeah, definitely. you're absolutely right. And one of the things that's kind of funny, even in the uh, in the GitHub repo, it, there's even um, one of the um, uh, documents in there. In the documentation, it's actually talking out to speaking directly to Windows developers or Microsoft developers, saying, "If you're running this, please reach out to our, uh, you know, the, the the Microsoft security team because we'd love you to do more of this and help." But it's just kind of funny to see that explicit call to the internal Microsoft employees here on their open source documentation. So really positive to see and fun to see as well. And of course, it also making me think of, you know, one love, one fuzz, let's get together and feel all right about all of the bugs that we can fix within our applications. Um, I also set myself up for a pretty gnarly tongue twister in the uh, intro in the last segment about more Bluetooth blemishes. Um, And so Bluetooth has another bug, this time affecting uh, Bluetooth BLE. And um, it stood out because um, Bluetooth is eventually going around out of flaws that they can use with words that start with BL. Um, but in this case, it is yet another spoofing attack um, that is also, I think, reinforces a point you made last week, uh, Matt. You had asked about um, the Bluetooth phone that we were talking about that was basically being able to overwrite authentication keys or downgrade the, the security of authentication keys. Matt's comment was, oh, well, you know, what does the actual spec say about fixing this? And I had actually looked at the spec and it wasn't qu- it wasn't too clear, but it basically calls out, you should be doing this, do this to avoid this particular type of problem to prevent authorization keys or authentication keys from being overwritten. In this write-up, the, the paper's researchers actually say, come out explicitly say that Part of the problem that came of this this spoofing issue was that there is actually two conflicting or very um, imprecise recommendations within the Bluetooth spec itself. So it's kind of really pointing out to saying that we can all we can point to implementation problems, um, but we can also point to design problems when the spec is not clearly well written, which leads to developers making these types of mistakes that leads to spoofing within pairing devices. So thought it was interesting just from that angle specifically. Yeah, and this is not the first uh, Bluetooth low energy vulnerability. I mean, these have been rolling out over the past couple of years. And I think we'll see potentially more of these types of vulnerabilities because we see all this new IoT stuff coming into the homes that are using these uh, Bluetooth low energy protocols because, again, these IoT devices weren't weren't built with with you know, performance and battery and all this additional stuff, right? So <laughs> our security, <they're> using, <laughs> yeah, or security, yeah, true, right? They were they were designed for, you know, how can I get away with the the cheapest, lowest battery life stuff yeah. available? So they're using this protocol, and now you're getting, now you're starting to see some of these flaws in the Bluetooth low energy spec. Yeah, absolutely. I think you could, I think you could almost say ahead. BTLE itself is a, is a security vulnerability. Yeah. Well, and it's going to be interesting, too, because th- this week and last week's Bluetooth phone was specifically around pairing. But Bluetooth has also, we talked about it, um, I think, last year um, th- that uh, at Apple's WWDC was talking about the improvements to find, find my iPhone. And they're talking about using Bluetooth protocol to basically do a privacy preserving or privacy friendly maybe is the best way to put it um, approach to saying what Bluetooth devices am I near now that doesn't need pairing in order to do that collection um, nor does uh, speaking of you know 2020 and whatever hellscape we are in right now about using Bluetooth for contact tracing things like that so 
Also, it doesn't need pairing, but it still is relying on these protocols for proximity um, because I love alliteration. Um, so it, it, I think you're right is that we're going to see a lot more of these volumes. What I'm curious to see is when they become uh, something more but, uh, more more worrisome than pairing with my home speakers over Bluetooth into here is something that is warmable. Here is something that is more impactful to the device itself. Yeah, because a, a well-crafted attack in Bluetooth gets really, really interesting when you think about proximity usage of Bluetooth. Um, that Those could be really, really devastating types of attacks. It's It'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the real world. Um, it, I mean, I guess if if you if I don't know if you guys have played any at all with with TrendU real world Bluetooth either scanning or correlation or any of these type of things. But what I've seen is you you start off with something that it, it's nice in the lab, but then when you actually go out and try and do some of the stuff out on out on the street, um, it's not nearly as easy as as scanning, for, say, for Wi-Fi. Um, and especially now with some. I, I think Apple came out on iOS 14. I think Google's coming out as well, the ability to to uh, randomize your your MAC addresses. Yeah. So um, it's it's interesting, but still, it's you need sort of like climbing. You need like a little bit of a foothold or a finger hold to get in there and, and sort of get your hands in. Um, but once once you sort of recognize something that you, you either need, to, I guess where I'm going, you need you need to either be able to identify and recognize what you're trying to attack, or just throw the kitchen sink at it and see what sticks. Um, and I, I guess you can go that path, but so it's it's a little more scary than I think it actually is. We'll just focus on yeah. Android because we know yeah. there's got to be a way into Android. <laughs> True. <laughs> that, that, that's the silence of truth in response to that. Absolutely. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, John brings up a great point about, you know, let's also step back, just think of the threat modeling, you know, what's at risk here, what can be compromised, what be the consequences. And that was on my mind when I actually was surprised about this next article that there's this capabilities in within Firefox on Android called um, uh, SSDP. So basically, this was a way to use the simple service discovery protocol, which is basically a subset of UPnP. So very old, speaking of Microsoft, way back to Windows 95, I think, even had UPnP um, for opening up um, ports on your local um, uh, local firewall um, when you're doing gaming. Um, but, uh, but the history of uh, history of UMP and PMP aside, um, this was interesting because flaw in Firefox and Android that basically if you're on the same local Wi-Fi network, you could spoof responses and then um, cause bad things to happen, trademark, copyright registered, um, to any Firefox browser on these devices. And I thought that was a bit scary and a bit surprising, too, that the browser has this capability and is actually listening for these UDP packets to say, hey, what's going on around me? Yep, because it's Android. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. It's not all that. I, you know, wow, I said that. I, di I didn't catch on fire when I said that. Um, uh, it, 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 this is, someone thought it was a good idea, right? It, 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 um, yeah. Somebody you did find this stuff on purpose. There, there is a reason yeah. why this is available on Android and not other platforms. I, something is something weird is there, right? They they did it for some reason. Probably forgot about it, left it there, or whatever. And then yeah. this vulnerability comes out. But it it just it, it goes back to my earlier point: is th there are there are specific platforms that you could target that would allow you to do some of the crazy stuff we're talking about, and Android just happens to be one of those. <laughs> It does indeed. and But that is not to say that Google has been remiss on, obviously, on their security knowledge, security research, security investigations from Project Zero to another article or a paper, actually, that I pulled out um, from a bunch of Google and other um, security researchers focused on the web. And this was a paper that's basically enumerating some common um, vulnerabilities and ways of attacking um, the browser, basically the DOM or web APIs that are coming out of web standards, and how they can be leveraged to attack the user or attack the browser. And so it was pretty neat that they basically pulled down to those broad categories, vulnerability prone APIs, attacks against websites, attacks against users. And it's going, it's not just saying here is interesting types of attacks out there. It's also calling out some forward looking capabilities. And some of them we've talked about in the past uh, we brought up, uh, we talked about the evolution of content sites, um, 
content security policy, sorry, uh, recent, more recent trusted types, uh, more recent cross-origin opener policy. So all these are very good things. And uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight on here as I continue to rant, and hopefully Matt hasn't fallen asleep yet, is that um, this is coming out of the Web Application Security Working Group. And what's really fun is that the, this working group has monthly meetings, and you can read through the minutes of their meetings or even participate. And the reason I bring that up is rather than just look at websites and revisit always the OWASP top 10, look at something like this paper or look at something like this Web Application Security Working Group. What are they talking about? What are they focusing on? What are they thinking about in terms of tweet, bringing towards new capabilities like same site cookies? And how can these concerns either apply to web applications you're building or what types of new uh, countermeasures or controls are being built that you can start to apply. So I thought that's a really way to stay on, if you will, the leading edge of what web application security is thinking about. I, I think this is a really great enumeration of the different types of attacks uh, on the browser and the web app. Uh, so I, I think this is great because I think this is that base foundational kind of learning that people need to be aware of. Like, why why shouldn't I do this? Or, or what are those uh, potential attack vectors. Um, but when I get down to the solution side, you know, I was hoping for a little more meat there. Mm -hmm. I'm trying yeah. to figure out how this is getting implemented uh, across different uh, either tools or as part of OWASP top 10. Where, where do these really start to come into detection of products so that we can see, do I have these issues in my web application. I, I didn't see that in here. I, I might have missed it, but I, I, I didn't see it. Yeah, you make a good point there. And one of the things that stood out to me, there's a figure, let's see, table one, a partial list of unsafe web features. And the solutions they break down into site opt-out, it's something new, so let's just set that aside. But between site opt-out and default disable as your solutions possibly means that as we're developing or as the, you know, as as we, the Royal We perhaps, or not the Royal We, uh, the Web App Security Working Group, is developing new features, new capabilities, maybe we should be revisiting what the defaults are for these features or whether it's opt-in versus opt-out. Because if that's what these default disable and, and site opt-out are, just to fix all of these problems, which, you know, there's at least a dozen of them in here, I think that's kind of saying that our approach to what our solutions are aren't necessarily great if we're saying, and by the way, developers, not only do you need to know if you're vulnerable to this, but you have to actually go and do something that's available to you that just wasn't turned on by default to do. So th there's some good underlying messages there about just rethinking in general how we should be approaching these types of standards. Yeah, there are 20 site opt-out and default disables in this list. Think about that from a automated detection and response perspective, right? If I can look for these 20 and make sure I'm addressing them, think about how much more secure the code's going to be. That's why I want to see the other side of this. I think it's a great enumeration of the issues. I'd like to see it come all the way through where we can eliminate these things more effectively. Absolutely great point. I think the only other thing I'll add to, to that is just that fundamental approach of what kind of what kind of vulnerability class can we get rid of? And you know, that's basically rephrasing what you're saying. So as a DevOps approach, DevSecOps approach, that's that's the most effective way you can do to to call back to our last point we were saying with Justin, how can you add value rather than latency to the development process? Add value by getting rid of a whole class to find, get rid of one of these types of vaults. Um, then that takes us to speaking of other things that we can do in our pipeline, um, another article about securing secrets within the pipeline. And here is something that I don't think is much of a surprise, um, both within all the cloud environments, Azure, GCP, um, AWS, they all have effective, you know, whatever their term is for a secrets management capability. Um, this was another article that's just re basically reaffirming the need for managing the secrets throughout the lifetime of the build process, making this, this separation between here staging, dev, production. Also wanted to call out that just coincidentally, speaking to Microsoft and things that we wouldn't, or that we would have been surprised to think about 10 years ago, is that uh, Microsoft also has a new PowerShell secrets tool um, that's going to have better secrets support, managing secrets, like a keychain in iOS, for example, or a macOS. Uh, but it's just interesting that PowerShell not only lives on 
Windows, but you can have PowerShell running on your Mac systems or your Linux system. So once again, what a change from 10, 20 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I When that thing came out, um, was that earlier this year or last? I, I remember downloading and running going, wow, I'm, I'm in a strange time right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I, I think, well, I... I don't know. It's I I I've been on sort of a bit of soul searching with with app second general the last week or two. With this one, hopefully most of us know by now. Um, don't put secrets into your source code. You know, passwords, keys, whatever have you. Um, it's great to see more tools coming out to make that easier to to um, to manage. And I think one of the cool things about the PowerShell example there is it gives you something on your your desktop, laptop, what have you, your keyboard to be able to manage and 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 uh um generate and control those um i know some shops that just use something say like vault then okay am i going to be working with an api to get into or do i go into their web interface then i have to expose the web interface to an operations point of view so how do you actually go through that process of managing them that can sometimes be tricky um i i think it sort of comes back against that that same point that we were talking about earlier of of how do you now you've got you know you need to have secrets. You know you need to not have the secret in the source code. Um, how do you make that something that a developer doesn't roll their eyes when they have to deal with it? Yeah, I think that's where CyberArk's done some really interesting stuff. I think we've interviewed them on this show and we've interviewed them on Enterprise Security Weekly as well. One of the things when they bought Conjure as part of that acquisition, they've open sourced some of these capabilities. And I think what's really interesting is they've tried to abstract the management aspects away from the development team where the developer is just like, yeah, I need credentials. I'm just going to point over here, and it, it will give me the credentials. I don't have to worry Perfect. about it. It's it's in there, right? It's like Prego. Yeah. It's in there. And, and so I think they've taken a really unique approach to solving aspects of this. And then a lot of this is, I think, available uh, open source as well. Uh, and so it, these are all interesting new tools and techniques that are coming up that I think will make it easier longer term. But you said something earlier. It's like, I think we know we shouldn't put our keys in our source code, but I think we still do in general. So uh, even though we know we shouldn't do it, I think it's it's actually a lot harder in reality than it is in theory. Well, it's, and it, again, this comes back to sort of, I think some of the questions I've asked on here over the last few weeks um, to, to our, our guests is, you know, focus around is is this type of thing, is this harder for a large enterprise dude that's been around for the last 20, 30 years, longer, or is it is it harder for a new startup? So the the older enterprise has all this baggage and like, you know, it's it's a lot of spaghetti code and how do we deal with it and manage it? And, and there's a, a lot of learning for them to actually come up to speed versus um, the young startup, they might not have the baggage, but they don't have either the, the resources or the know-how to actually get that stuff in place. So I'm not sure who it's easier for. Um, so in this case, the startup, the young startup with like, you know, not a lot of source code, I'd hope that it'd be easier for them to get secret management correct uh, versus, um, you know, the the IBMs of the world just to use a name. Uh, good luck finding all the secrets over there. In this article, they mentioned Intel. Let's, let's pick on them. Um, and that Intel, um, if I happen to have a copy of that Intel leak, which obviously I don't, but if I happen to have a copy of it, um, I haven't seen any of the secrets in there. So. But think about Intel and all their chips. How do you track down all their um, uh, their uh, firmware? How do you track down or keep track of all that in a legacy company? I guess is the point there. Yeah, I think, and for me, what stands out too is that I, I like the idea of using those any of those secrets management tools because you can also then build really good access management on top of that. So uh, you just say, ah, I, this app needs to talk to this other app or this ne app needs access to this encryption key. You can also then layer on some really good access controls and then possibly also build logging on top of that so you can detect unauthorized access or anomalous access, which is also really good. But just as Matt was pointing, asking the question, how hard is it in practice to keep these secrets out of code? Also, have to make sure you're keeping these secrets out of your logs as as justin was pointing out in the last segment because if you're starting to if you're uh, logging cookies if you're logging headers those are often places where those you know those types of credentials even if they're short-term tokens um, may pop up in logs and you want to be careful that you're not overexposing yourself to um an easy service compromise when someone had can just find you know bypass all your access management grab the keys that way 
And I also so had two final articles here that, that um, flew across my radar, um, pa partially because uh, we're going back to a little bit of aerospace and application security. I know, John, you um, over the past couple months have been occasionally finding an, an article or two about this. Um, in, in one case, there is the Air Force is talking about that and um, has been adopting a DevOps principles over the past several months. And they have uh, quite extensive documentation documentation about what they mean by DevOps, what those practices look like. Um, so lots of PDFs you can read about that just to learn about what does an approach to that agile type of approach um, look like, and I just use approach too many times there. But speaking of which, there are also no details yet, but they're also thinking about he, or going to demonstrate here's how to perform a software upgrade of a plane in flight, a fighter jet. Um, so talk about a high pressure, pretty interesting environment to apply your DevOps principles to about we're just going to do it in prod. So I thought that was pretty interesting and something we'll keep an eye on as, uh, as hopefully we get some more details. Yeah, yeah it was an interesting a... read. I'm like, ooh, you sure you want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that that's what I thought at first. Um, and I think both of you guys know, I, well, I, I think there's a chance you both might, might know, um, Nicholas, the software's are they're, they're referring. Um, and so at first, yeah, it's like, oh, my God, you're going to update the software on a, I, do they mention 16s in here? Because I know they're it's running Kubernetes. I think it's the up 30. Well, oh, up 35 right. is looking at it for sure. What's the other so one? So they're. I know they're running Kubernetes on the 16. Um, so they're mm. probably doing something crazy on the, um, the F35. I saw the weight of that in the last week or two. I was like, yeah, they can fit a few servers in there without even blinking. But um, <laughs> point, point being, the reason I mentioned that is, you know, at first it sounds okay, you're going to reboot a, a 35 in the air, which my understanding is if the computers go down on that for more than a second or two, you're, you're, you're done. Um, but so at first that sounds super scary, but then you start thinking about everything we've talked about for the last year of you know blue green deployments or red green or um, um, all these different ways of, of trying to do a, a canary style deployment and it's like okay that makes sense they're probably at the point that they should be able to start doing this type of stuff um, and Nicholas has been pushing he's been trying to push some leading edge stuff over there for the last year or two so um, I, I, I could see it happening I, I wouldn't surprise me that much I mean that's the no. ultimate test for I think for 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 a DevSecOps program, right? Is that you're yeah. confident enough that it's secure and that you can deploy in flight. I mean that that it, it, it's like almost like the the space missions, right? I mean the ability to to update the the capsule or you know make changes when you're in space. I mean that that's pretty high risk, high tense kind of stuff. Yeah, it's just Absolutely. checking. That's a what a ninety-four million dollar plane, between ninety to one hundred twenty million dollar plane that you're you're willing to take the chance to do a deployment on live. Got to be sort of confident, yeah. Yeah. Not alone the people on it and whatever's around on the ground that it might crash into, but yeah, it's, it's be fun to watch. Let's see that at air shows. And next for the next pass, he's going to do a live code update. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, I want to be able to make the, the the Top Gun reference. Call the bug, Maverick. Call the bug. Um, which, if for those of you out there, yes, I know those are Navy flyers, not Air Force, but still going to make the movie reference. Um, but that brings us to one final article that's a little bit more grounded, but still associated with uh, flight. And uh, this is a write-up from mango.pdf.zone um, that was definitely making all of the rounds in InfoSec last week um, about a very entertaining read about someone who was basically challenged and said, hey, look, here is a boarding pass just so happens to belong to a prime minister of um, Australia and it has a barcode on it and what kind of fun information is encoded in barcodes and um, the same would be true we could more generalize this to QR codes or other types of basically machine readable but not human readable coding that's people take pictures of and post on Instagram Twitter or whatever their social media place of choice um, and what I'm, I'm going to keep I'm not going to add too many spoilers here but what was discovered quickly is that they actually didn't even need to reverse engineer the barcode because the actual a tracking number was printed in human readable text on the uh, ticket and then the researcher went and essentially did a you know, expect element on a web page and started to find some interesting information so it really pointed out that 
application security can manifest in fun and surprising ways. And in this case, especially, didn't even need uh, Burp or Zed Attack Proxy in terms of um, you know the, this web application hacking, if you will. It was really just view source and what can be done from there. So very entertaining, highlighting it from a good lessons learned that could be more generalized, even if you're not just running a, um, a web application for a flight tracking or reservation. Yeah, it, it's a great read. Um, yeah. it, it very interesting his approach. I think my where I'd like to see some of this research go next is those sites that serve up QR codes. If you do an inspect element, are there ways to pull some of this interesting data out or not um, behind the scenes? So I, I think there's there's like a, another phase to this project that could be really really interesting from a research perspective. Hmm. And you know yeah, it's. it's Go ahead, John. We're all, we're all talking about how fun of a read this is, and I, I think it uh, sincerely it's worth reading, particularly for I mean th this is like a for me this is a Friday afternoon have fun read. It, this is this is really entertaining. Um, lots of cultural references in it, but I think mm -hmm. there's something there for people to think about. You know, we always talk about or frequently either we get asked or we talk about um, how do you get your idea up into management, right? Or how do you get other people to think about? And I'm always talking about how do I get security being talked about outside of our little bubble. Um, this is a really good example of how to do it, right? You know, um, don't be using the nerdery or all the, the phrases which we talk about every day on here on this podcast every week, but make it interesting and fun for, you know, something that we get passed around on the internet like it, this one's being done. Yeah, that that's a great point. We're we're getting an insight into the uh, attack, you know, the attack modeling, if you will, the approach to attacking. And great point about communicating. Here is a vuln that was found. This reads much differently than if this were just posted to um, a sort of hacker one screed, or you yeah. wouldn't believe that they ignored me for so long. What idiots types of uh, types of approach. So it was both very constructive as well as very entertaining, as we've been saying several times. So once you've finished listening to this podcast, definitely go give that one a read obviously not and, as entertaining as we are <laughs> you don't get your bob marley references and top gun references from a from a read like that only here on application security weekly and that's why i want to say thank you for matt and john for suffering through all of my pop culture references as well uh, thank you also everyone for joining us both in discord and our live stream as well as listening to this after the fact we'll be back next week with application security weekly